Welcome to Global Connections with Robert Siegel, presented by the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, our monthly leaders forum, addressing vital issues facing society, the economy, real estate, medicine, technology, and science. My name is Dr. Joshua Plout, and I am the Executive Director of American Friends of Rabin Medical Center, a national nonprofit. We represent Israel's premier hospital, Rabin Medical Center in Petah Tikva in Greater Tel Aviv, that serves annually 1 million patients of all ethnic and religious backgrounds with the same compassionate care. Please support our mission. Join our community of friends. Visit American Friends of Rabin Medical Center online, AFRMC, via our website, and social media outlets on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Our host and moderator for Global Connections is Robert Siegel, former host of All Things Considered on National Public Radio for 30 years. Over the course of an hour each month, Global Connections features three to four guests who Robert Siegel interviews as they explore important issues and challenges in our world arising from the global pandemic. Today's Global Connections topic is civic discourse in America with Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire, David Brooks of the New York Times, Yael Eisenstadt, visiting fellow at Cornell Tech, and now Robert Siegel. Thank you, thank you, Josh. We start with David Brooks, uh, whose most recent book is The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. Uh, David, first of all, welcome. It's great to uh, see you, even uh, in this way that we now see people, uh, and, and, and to talk with you. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you. I shared uh, 20 of your 31 years on All Things Considered. On All Things Considered, and, regularly. and as I said in our first uh, se- uh, webinar in which E.J. Dion was on, you, you were the two guys I know who know politics as a scholarly discipline and as a reporter's beat. And uh, it's, it's a rare depth that you, you bring to those questions. A few weeks ago, you wrote about uh, the five epic crises uh, the US faces these days, fighting COVID-19, uh, taking on board uh, what African-Americans experience when they confront the police, also a political realignment, uh, the rise of a social justice ideology, and of course, the economic crisis. When you survey this landscape of, uh, of, of crises, are you struck by American resilience and grit, or are you struck by our national shortcomings uh, that we're displaying in the face of all those challenges? Yeah, I've added a sixth crisis or a sixth transition, which is a generational shift. I think a, a younger generation in every organization I'm familiar with is one demanding power and taking power. Uh, and so that it's made it the hardest time in my career to figure out what's going on to be a commentator, because you don't know which is important, which is not. And at first in the pandemic, ra- around March and April, I was writing a piece for the Atlantic called The Year That Made America. And my thesis was that we were pulling together in a time of crisis. And despite wh- whatever was happening in the White House, which I think is a disaster, the American people in neighborhood after neighborhood, everybody I was interviewing, was really impressed by people around them. Uh, and so I stuck with that very optimistic take for about six weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's just impossible to maintain that. So now I think I'm going to write a piece called The Year That Broke America. And and what's broken is, first of all, our trust in one another, uh, our inability to believe that the people around us are trustworthy and they'll help us out and we'll help them out. What's broken is our emotional state. A third of Americans are suffering from clinical levels of depression and anxiety, according to the Census Bureau. Uh, and what's broken is polarization, what had been a depolarized time is now a widely polarized time. And so perceptions of the pandemic, perceptions of masks, everything is now once again seen through red blue lenses. And so this has been a, just a, de- a depressing period as almost every institution and every social connection in our society has failed to perform. Yeah, I was going to mention the politicization of the mask as a measure of, of what's happened this year. We may have a truce in that particular war uh, as the, the the president endorsed mask wearing uh, this week, but do you do you see any any uh, any positive signs out of this mess that we're in right now? Yeah, I guess a couple. I think the 
racial reckoning has been a very positive sign. I mean, if you look at, at how white Americans now view the black experience, I think they have a much more realistic view of the, the injustices that African Americans face every day. I think that's very positive. Uh, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we, in my view, are leaving a deadlock 50-50 America. Uh, the, the pre, you know, we started the year where Republicans had a 49% support and Democrats had 47. Right now, Democrats have 50 and Republicans have 39. Uh, and I should add, we're having a little problem with your, with your Zoom connection, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but I could follow everything that, that you said there. As for what you've described as the quasi-religion of social justice, uh, which has become very popular, uh, uh, perhaps especially with the younger generation, but not only, uh, as you point out, uh, it's much easier to respond uh, to demands for symbolic gestures or uh, amended narratives than with substantive policy. To me, uh, it's summed up by a peculiar non sequitur of this year that uh, in the spring, the, the third uh, highest rate of infection in the U.S. after New York City and the Jersey suburbs was the Navajo Nation. Uh, and the Washington football team will not be called the Redskins again in the, in the fall. There seems to be a, a, an enormous chasm between the, the gravity of the crises we're seeing dis on display and, and the kinds of fixes that we're seeing. Yeah, and the social justice movement, you know, I agree with a lot of its goals, but it emerged from the universities and it emerged from a certain theory of critical theory. And so it focuses a lot on cultural symbols and words and language. Uh, and should black be uppercase or lowercase? And I'm perfectly willing to go with whatever people want. Uh, and with the Redskins, if Native Americans don't like it, fine. The, we, it's impolite to impose a name that's insulting to people. But when you've got 14% unemployment, when 150,000, whatever it is, are dying, uh, it just seems to me we need actual change. And the injustices that have been exposed by the disease, the African Americans dying at you know twice the rates, getting infected at way higher rates, uh, the in disparities of income and wealth, that requires legislation. As I wrote in that column, it's more C-SPAN than Instagram. Yeah. And so posting on social media is just inadequate. And, you know, I said in there, I thank God Joe Biden has got the nomination because he's someone with legislative experience. He's someone who just does not do cultural politics. That's just not how he thinks. He sort of escaped the 60s without being on either side of the culture war. And so if he can have a set of policies, which he's indeed now enrolling, I'm much happier to talk about that than being stuck in Donald Trump's perpetual TV reality, you know, the culture war. And so I'm hoping we'll end the culture war. Uh, and as, so my problem with the social justice is cultural agitation, agitation, agitation. How does that lead to change? What's the theory of change? And I don't think there's an adequate one. As, as you uh, uh, alluded to earlier, and I think this is when, you're, when journalists are in the thick of any story that they're trying to report on, uh, in the middle of it, we don't really know whether we're at the beginning, middle or the end, where, where things are headed, how it, how it will wrap up. I wonder, as hard as it is to sort out, what if this uh, season of change might permanently affect American life and what seems to be uh, perhaps more ephemeral? Uh, do you have any thoughts about, about what, what, say, what's, what, what's likely to stick from all this? Yeah, I go into it focusing on the whole situation through the lens of social trust. So in the 1950s, 60s, 40s, 80% of Americans trusted their institutions. And so they could be effective. Now it's down to 19%. In a generation ago, 55% of Americans say, yeah, the people, my neighbors are trustworthy. Now it's down to 31%. And this is very age related. So boomers or silent generation have a high trust in their neighborhoods. Millennials and Gen Z, it's about 17%. Mm. Low trust, if you ask millennials or Gen Z, are most people selfish and only out for themselves? 71% say yes. It's very hard to do a collective action problem, like tackling a pandemic, without trust. It's very hard to, have, hard to have a successful society. And so my fear right now is that young people in particular, who are still forming their mentality, are looking at society and saying, this place is not trustworthy. Mm. And if that happens, it's very hard to do, have an economy because trust is the lubricant. It's very hard for people to have spontaneous sociability, the ability to organize with your neighbors to do stuff. 
And so you really are throwing sand in the gears of the whole society. You know, David, I'm, I'm, I'm retired. Uh, and uh, the idea of uh, isolation or self-quarantine when you're retired, uh, you know, is, is a lot less challenging than, uh, than trying to deal with the world every day and, 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 and work. And I'm, I'm curious what it's been like. That is, uh, you know, one, one reading of, of this season is that uh, lots of people who used to go to offices uh, are not going to are never going to go back to offices. They're going to they're going to uh, stay at home uh, and 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 work from there. Uh, and the offices are going to be half empty. I mean, how? Just I'm just curious personally. What has it been like uh, writing about the state of the country fr from from the confines of your uh, of your home? Inadequate. <laughs> uh, you know, my friend, our friend EJ Dion is a hugger, yeah. and if you're on EJ, he's hugging you. I am not a hugger. I once covered Bill Clinton and he had his arm around me during an interview and I like would scurl away because I'm just not comfortable with it. And even I am desperate for hugging. Uh, and when I do a story, if, if you don't go to a place, you don't know it. And so I, I, I can't cover New Hampshire if I'm sitting here in Maryland. Uh, and so I think there's a great loss of, of connection, but also a loss of intelligence uh, it's well established in social science literature that um, groups that are in person are much smarter in making decisions than groups electronically. For me, it has been, I mean, I'm blessed. I don't have little kids and I'm in a beautiful spot, but uh, I think it's easy to underestimate how much emotional strain and how much mental strain. I'm, I'm tired every morning by 11 a.m. It's easy to underestimate how much emotionally trying this has been. Gallup does a study where they ask, how, how's your well-being? We've suffered the greatest drop in well-being in American history. And the, the time they compared this to was there was a similar drop in well-being in Tunisia before the Arab Spring. And so you expect uprisings in a time of emotional stress and trauma, which I think this has been a long episode of. Well, David, hang around, uh, because in about 20 minutes, we'll have the, the Q&A session and the attendees will be able to put questions to you. Uh, but uh, David Brooks of the New York Times, thanks as always for your, for your thoughts. It's been great seeing you. Uh, joining us now is Senator Jean Shaheen. Uh, she is a New Hampshire Democrat. She's seeking a third term in office this year. She's a former governor of the state, also former director of Harvard University's Institute of Politics, uh, Senator Shaheen. Uh, thank you very much for helping us navigate the new abnormal today. You've expressed concern about restoring uh, civic discourse and bipartisanship to our to our political life. What are, what's something something concrete uh, that might come out of this experience of this year that would mark a change in that direction? You know, I, I think there are. I, I hope that what will come out of this is some of the things that David talked about, that there will be a response to the big challenges that are facing this country, and that um, people will recognize that we've got to work together as has happened in so many places in response to this pandemic. You know, um, I think nothing really gets done in Washington without bipartisan support, and in order to do that, we need to think about ways to improve bipartisanship and get people to work better together. I think there are some structural changes that would make that happen better. One is to deal with the campaign finance system that we have. We have too much money in politics right now. That affects um, how people in elective office, particularly in Congress, respond. I think we have uh, a system of gerrymandering that means that we don't have to discuss with people who disagree with us um, what their views are and really listen to views that may be opposing to our own. We have the filibuster in the Senate, which while I don't think we should get rid of it, I think it needs reform. Um, we, we need to restore civics education in our schools. So there are a number of things that I think we could do that would improve that um, civic discourse in a way that would be good for the country. And, and obviously, I support a change in leadership. Yeah. I think a president who is not, um, doesn't get up every morning and think about how to divide the country, but thinks about how to unite us is something that 
would go a long way because leadership really does make yeah. a difference. I, I want to pursue the question of, of uh, the filibuster, you know, which you mentioned. Uh, there are, you know, there are some forecasts out there that this could be a very good Democratic year and there could be a Democratic majority in the Senate and uh, that Biden uh, at this point in the polls is running ahead of President uh, Trump. Uh, but I haven't seen any polls suggesting 60 Democratic seats. Uh, in right. The, uh, uh, and 60 is what you need to legislate. In, in the old days, our parties were odd, odd coalitions of, 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 of different groups so that there would be a number of Republicans who were more uh, liberal than the most conservative Democrats and a number of Democrats more conservative than the most liberal Republicans. Now we have rational parties. Uh, and uh, so it seems as if bipartisanship uh, is, is would seem to be almost impossible to achieve, uh, that is, when you look across the aisle, uh, you know, all the Arl inspectors became Democrats, all the Shelbys, you know, became Republicans. Is, is it realistic to think in terms of, of uh, getting 60 votes for everything? Or is it time to say enough of this 60 vote business? If you have 51 votes, that's a majority. Uh, that's how the House of Commons does it in Britain. We can legislate that way too. Well, I think it's something that we need to examine very closely. I think there are ways to reform the filibuster that would make it work better. But, you know, our, our country was built on majority rule and minority rights. And one of the things that the filibuster is designed to do is to protect those minority rights. Unfortunately, what we've seen in the last three or four decades is an increasing use of the filibuster to prevent things from happening. Um, and, you know, when I first got to the Senate back in 2009, I thought we needed to get rid of the filibuster because I was in the majority and, you know, we, Democrats controlled the White House and so we were able to get things done and we were prevented from doing that by this pesky Republican minority. Now that I'm in the pesky Democratic minority, yeah. um, I'm less inclined to think that we should get rid of the filibuster because there are a lot of, um, legislative priorities that I think would be undone by the majority in a way that I think would not be good for the country. But having said that, I do think there are ways to make changes in it. You know, when we think about the filibuster, we think about um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington and the idea that somebody's going to stand up and talk to the issue for hours at a time, like we saw with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, where um, we saw numerous people control the floor and prevent something from happening back in the 60s. That's not the way it happens today. And maybe we need to think about whether we're going to require somebody to take to the floor to really talk about the issue and give the reasons why you support or oppose a particular issue. But, Another but, way to uh, deal with but, it would be to flip the, the numbers. So right now, you have to have 60 votes to pass something. Well, let's make it 40 votes to prevent it because that puts the onus on the people who are trying to keep something from happening. But you know, I've heard it said often that if, if, the re if you really had to have a filibuster, then there would be fewer filibusters. But when Ted Cruz took to the floor and recited Dr. Seuss, uh, I, I don't recall people celebrating that as a moment of, of a civic, you know, improved civic discourse in Washington. It, it, it only angered people further. Uh, and uh, uh, where, I guess what I'm asking is the same question I put to David, where are the signs of hopefulness here? <laughs> that is, where, where do you see uh, the encouragement that we can go from, well, we've, we've had a uh, more than a decade and three presidencies that failed to, failed to pass an immigration uh, law that would have repaired an obviously broken system. Uh, does COVID-19 change that at all? Does it, does it make people more, more serious about, about legislating? I think it's too soon to know the answer to that. You know, I, I remember being in college in the 1960s and um, being opposed to the Vietnam War and engaging with my political science professor over the fact that we have tens of thousands of people marching in the streets. Why wasn't the American policy on the Vietnam War changing? And he said to me, when enough people get upset enough about what's going on in the country, then the policies are gonna change. And while certainly as an adult and as somebody who's involved in politics, 
it often takes a lot longer for that to happen than I would like for it to. But I do think that's part of our democracy. And if we can allow it to work, then, um, and we can get people engaged in it, then we will see policies that reflect where the majority of our voters are. Um, but what we've done is we've allowed um, oh, changes that really affect the ability of voters to have their voices heard. And, and I would argue that one of the major ways that has happened is through our campaign finance system. That the Citizens United decision that says that corporations are people that the increasing amounts of money that are in our system are corrupting it in ways that have a real corrosive effect on our democracy. I'm going to ask you one question on a completely different subject. Uh, because, because we're doing this for the Rabin Medical Center, which is in Israel, um, the, uh, the Trump administration has, would, would describe itself as the most pro-Israel administration that, that has ever existed. Uh, do, is, is Israel a controversial subject within the Democratic Party? Uh, might annexation of the West Bank, in fact, jeopardize relations between Israel and, and, uh, and, and a government in which the Democratic Party was in the majority? Um, most of the Democrats who I have talked to are concerned about efforts to annex the West Bank because it totally undercuts the idea of a two-state solution to the problems between Israel and the Palestinians. And I share that view. I think it would be, um, I think the solution to um, Israel and the Palestinians is still a two-state solution, but the time is running out very quickly on that. An annexation of the West Bank would certainly be a death knell, I, I fear, to the idea that we could have a two-state solution. And, and, and one other domestic question. I, I, you've won a lot of elections. The, the one you lost, that, which included people going to, they were convicted of dirty tricks against you. Right. But they also ran against you for having raised a tax when you were governor. New, New Hampshire is not a great state in which to, in which to raise taxes. Uh, given that we've just passed some trillion dollar bills and that uh, there's talk of repealing, obviously Demo Democrats want to repeal the Trump tax cut, uh, are, are Americans ready to, um, to, pay, to pay for a new era of, of government that addresses the problems we, we share these days? Well, I think today Americans are just worried about putting food on the table and paying the rent. And every economist that I've talked to has said that now is not the time to talk about paying down the debt and worrying about the deficit. Now is the time to ensure that people can have a job, that they can um, that kids can go back to school, that people can get the basic needs that um, every family wants. And that's where I think we've got to be focused. And that's why I've been supportive of the various legislative packages to deal with the coronavirus, why I think we've got to have another one, because kids aren't going to go back to school unless school districts get help. People aren't going to be able to send their kids back to childcare unless childcare centers get help. Small businesses still need help if they're gonna to continue to get stood up and hire back all of their employees. So we've still got a lot of work to do. And the first thing we've gotta do is defeat this coronavirus. And that means we need more testing, more contact tracing. We need a plan in Washington that we still have not seen, even though you know, this has been going on. We've known it was a problem since February. We still don't have a plan for how to address that. And what we're hearing now from this president is that he doesn't believe we need any more testing. Well, I was just in New Hampshire last week at a testing site where they told me that our test results are getting delayed in New Hampshire because so many of the tests coming from hot spots out in the South and West are going to our testing labs in New Hampshire, which is delaying the results that we're getting. So. This is related to all of us. We all better understand that we're in the same boat when it comes to this coronavirus, and we've got to have a plan that's going to help everybody get out of it, and that will allow us to address those other items on David Brooks' list of challenges that we're facing in this country. Well, Senator Jean, Jean stick around, uh, because in about 10 minutes we'll be taking 
questions from attendees. Thank you very much. Uh, our next guest is deeply interested in restoring trust in the information uh, that we see and read about politics, particularly the information on Facebook. Uh, after several years as a CIA officer, at one time she was assigned to Vice President Joe Biden, uh, Yael Eisenstadt signed on as Facebook's head of global elections integrity operations. Uh, she was concerned about how the social media giant uh, disseminates political information and misinformation. A few months later, she left, uh, warning that Facebook's very business model exacerbates the problem of fake news and ideological echo chambers. Yael Eisenstadt, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Uh, I suppose uh, a, a defender of, of uh, the Facebook business model would say uh, Mark Zuckerberg is not a publisher or an editor. He, he's, he, he's more like the custodian of the town square or he's the telephone company, which we don't hold responsible for everything that's said on the telephone. Uh, people are exercising the First Amendment when they publish on Facebook. What, what's wrong with that claim? Ah, you went right to the heart of the matter, my favorite question. Um, so to understand why that's so important to decide if they're a publisher or not is because in fact, as long as they are not classified as anything other than a neutral intermediary, they have uh, this blanket immunity from bearing any responsibility for the content on their platform. Now, why that's problematic is I absolutely agree that the First Amendment means that the government cannot intrude on people's right to free speech. First and foremost, this is a private company, so it's a slightly different situation. But more importantly, there's a big difference between having the freedom to say what you want online and having a company amplify what you say to as many as 3 billion people. And so those are two very different things. And while Facebook you know, I actually don't think Facebook should necessarily be responsible for every piece of content. I don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be the arbiter of truth. I don't want him to be the one deciding what is true and what is false. However, because of the business model and way the company is set up, what it means is their algorithms, number one goal is to keep you on their platform, right? That way they hoover up all your data, they're able to profile you into these smaller and smaller segments so that they can target you with ads, so that they know if you're more likely to respond to a Reebok ad or a Nike ad. Now, why is that a problem? Because the algorithms have figured out that in order to keep us engaged, they have to send us, they, they keep boosting more and more salacious content. And so for me, the idea of responsibility, the idea of, I actually don't think they should be classified as a publisher either. I think they're a whole new category. And it's some sort of like a digital curator. Their company, their algorithms decide who it's amplifying, whose voices is, are getting the most play. And in fact, it's often suppressing voices of people who don't want to play the salacious click game, right? It's actually amplifying. It's not amplifying someone because they're the biggest expert. It's not amplifying someone because they are giving fact-checked, reasoned debate or stories. It's amplifying people because that content keeps you engaged. So to me, the bigger question is not, are they a publisher or are they a platform? My question is, should they bear responsibility for if their recommendation engines recommend more conspiracy theories than, than news? Right. Uh, well, look, let me play the defender of the, of, of, of the, business, of the business, business model. One more, one more question. Uh, is, is what you're describing really the same thing, though, that the editor of the New York Post over here and the Guardian over there have been doing for decades to find the stories that they think their readers will be most uh, uh, attracted to, uh, and then uh, get those people to also see the advertising in the paper. Uh, but that's been happening at human speed. Now it's happening at uh, hyper normal uh, speed. Is it simply the technology uh, that is uh, the problem here, in, in, in its, in its, and the power of that technology? So that's a great question because obviously before this business model, there were gatekeepers and, and you know, I know you are from a media background, but I do think there's a, there is a good 
side to ampl to having more voices be part of the conversation than just completely traditional gatekeepers. I think that's a real positive, but it is a different system because whereas a newspaper, obviously they want to keep you, they want to decide what they're going to put above the fold, behind the fold, what stories they're going to print, and they want their ads to be relevant, maybe by zip code, by where this newspaper is going very different than a machine that is actually using your human behavioral data, both from what you are doing on their platform and inferred behavior and tracks you all over the internet and then segments you into these smaller and smaller categories so that ads can really hyper target you. And I want to explain why that's so important. You know, in political discourse, for example, which to be really clear, that's what brought me to Facebook to begin with was Five years ago, I felt that the breakdown in civil discourse was the biggest threat to our democracy. Having spent most of my career in the counter extremism world, this felt more dangerous. Mm. But, you know, we have an election coming up. The way Facebook explains it is that political speech is already the most scrutinized speech in the world. That is their response to why they will not fact check political candidates um, on their platform. And I would argue, yes, I would like political speech to be the most scrutinized speech in the world. But when a politician can run thousands, tens of thousands of different versions of an ad, micro-targeted to a level where you and I might live across the street from each other, but we're not even seeing the same ad, we can't come together and debate that content. And, and so that's one major thing. And then the way the platform gets manipulated is political operatives. In 2016, it was the Russians. Now we're seeing it's more and more sort of domestic political actors. They can exploit that in such dangerous ways. Like for example, they can target you. I mean, for me right now, one of the biggest concerns is how voter suppression is going to play out on the platform. And let's say somebody wanted to target people not just by the city they live in, and they can't target you necessarily by race because that's too obvious, but they can target you by people who liked this particular page. Let's say that particular page very much plays to a certain demographic. And then they target their ad about mail-in ballots and fraud and all these whatever they want to say to that same group where no one else is seeing that, that's a hugely concerning issue. But do, do, you, do you, uh, you, you would say, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of how you try to remedy the situation or, or solve what you perceive to be the problem. You're saying you don't want Mark Zuckerberg or anybody else to, to be the arbiter of what's true and what, what their subscribers can see, what their members uh, can see. Uh, an alternative would be to simply ban uh, these uh, algorithms that connect uh, information with targeted uh, recipients, which seems um, it seems unlikely to me, but it, it might be effective. Uh, if indeed those aren't effective uh, responses to what the problem is, what is an effective response to the problem? So there's sort of the immediate because we have an election coming up and then the longer term goals of what I think would be effective. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to figure out how to put together packages of smart legislation. Let's be clear, this is the only industry that has never had their responsibility defined. They continue in 2020, except for in the most extreme cases or in cases of intellectual property, to have free reign and no responsibility. They can say, we're so sorry this happened, but there's still been zero accountability for what happened with the Russians in 2016 on these platforms. So first and foremost, I do think we absolutely need smart legislation. And it's a package. It's, there's not one piece of magical legislation that's going to fix everything. The number one thing for me is about transparency. Because I'm not saying get rid of the algorithms and make it all human review. That's impossible. I do think, though, that this, they operate in a black box. And if you could build in some sort of transparency requirement around the recommendation engines, and, and just let me give you, let me walk you through a really quick example if I yeah. can. So there's this group called the Boogaloo Boys. Uh, they're getting more prominence now. They basically advocate civil war. Many would describe them as a white supremacist group. There's lots of ways to describe this group. One of the Boogaloo, bo two of the Boogaloo Boys are actually responsible for killing a federal officer in Oakland by exploiting the Black Lives Matters protests and they killed a federal officer. So here's my question. Do you think Facebook should be responsible for the fact that Boogaloo Boys content is on their platform? Now, I can see both sides of that argument, right? Freedom of speech, 
And I, and I agree with that. Freedom of speech, I don't know if we should shut them down. Okay. Well, we, we, have, a concept of, we have a concept of incitement, which, which is a, a- But even worse, these two men met in mm -hmm. a Blue Boys group on Facebook. That's where they met each other. And they hashed out their plan via messenger, according to court documents. So my second question is, okay, even if you believe that they have the First Amendment right to say whatever they want on the platform, do you think the platform should be held responsible if it's if for the fact that they met in a group, in a private group? And more importantly, what if we found out that their recommendation engine is the one that introduced one or two of those men into that Facebook group that they weren't even looking for it to begin with? And that's the question that we'll never have the answer to because there is no requirement for Facebook to be transparent about their recommendation engines or their algorithms. And so I think transparency is a huge piece of it. And then we could decide what are the rules of the road for what we want to hold them accountable but for. Would, would transparency amount to a long scroll of a, a very small print uh, that, like so many other disclosures that we confront in, in, in commercial life, uh, go by, we click on them. Okay, I agree with that. Nobody, hardly anybody. I don't mean transparency for us, to be yeah. clear. This this goes into the debate of responsibility and right. Section 230 and all these things. It's a question of, if we defined that there had to be transparency around how the recommendation engines, what content was recommended versus right. what was organically found, then you could have some sort of a government oversight board that has access to that data. I don't mean that I should be able to look up every single thing, why did this person right. see this content? But right now, again, so, so here's the biggest issue. There's no checks and balances right now on the company. So right now, there's so many people screaming about hate on Facebook and, and hate groups and all of this. Normally, the mechanisms in the United States, a board, first of all, should be able to put their CEO in check. They can't at Facebook because of their dual class structure. The public should have some sort of mechanism, often through shareholder resolutions. Shareholders have no power because of their dual class structure. Advertisers, they're the money engines who are starting to see them step up. But as Mark Zuckerberg was caught on tape saying last week, they'll be back because he basically has the monopoly over where they can advertise. So the last one would be the free market. People love to say the free market will always correct. Well, when the FTC fined Facebook five billion dollars last summer for data privacy violations, the market rallied and their stock soared that very day because they said, huh, you got away with it. Five billion dollars is pocket change and you didn't really have to change anything. Right. So in my opinion, the only, only group that can really affect this right now is to figure out how to create smart legislation that creates a healthier info ecosystem, creates transparency around how they operate, but still allows for the flourishing of social media. Gail Eisenstadt, who is now a visiting uh, a fellow at Cornell Tech, stay with us, because now it's time for questions uh, from our attendees. A, uh, an attendee asks, Senator Shaheen, what public policies need to be legislated immediately to help with turning the tide versus COVID-19? Um, well, as I said, what we need is um, more support for states so that they can continue to do testing and contact tracing, which is really important. Um, they need help with, um, I think states need help with state and local government relief because they're responding to COVID-19 and needing to put together plans. And right now we're not really providing help for them at the state and local level as we think about the next package. Obviously we need to continue to support uh, the effort to develop a vaccine and all of the research that goes along with that. So that's where I would start. Okay, a question for David Brooks. Uh, how do we deal with issues which, in which cancel culture might <laughs> uh, conflict with the first amendment? Uh, go with the First Amendment. <laughs> simple, simple answer. Um, what's happening is that the parameters of what's sayable are shifting. Uh, and sometimes that's inevitable and sometimes that's good. New voices are coming into the debate. African Americans have not had voice, as much voice as they should. They're coming into the debate. The problem is that a lot of people are defining very narrowly what's sayable in their platform. So for example, this week, uh, 
at the New York Magazine, Andrew Sullivan, a very prominent and I think an extremely good columnist, was let go because his brand of liberalism is outside of what's sayable on that platform. Uh, readers have an intolerance to be disturbed. And so the bad news is that guy has no voice on that platform. The good news is he goes off to Substack, a, a new platform online where people can pay writers directly, and he immediately gets 60,000 uh, readers, subscribers. He's immediately financially viable. And so what's happening is people who are heterodox, who would get kicked out of a normal media platform because of how narrow it's becoming, can find another platform and another way to reach readers outside the established structures. So the, the bad news is the narrowing of, of debate, which is certainly happening, the climate of fear and uncertainty, but the opening up of new options, because there's so many people who do want open debate. Uh, Yael, this is a question for you. How should Facebook deal with conspiracy theorists uh, who use its platform to promote uh, uh, its views and, its, and candidates for public office? Good, and candidates for public office goes straight to this probably the QAnon debacle that we are <laughs> currently in. But um, listen, conspiracy theories, obviously part of what's so complicated is who's gonna fact check, how are you gonna figure out what is a conspiracy theory and what is not. That said, as I mentioned about the algorithms, the amount of conspiracy theories that are getting amplification from these platforms because they have figured out how to game the algorithms is really concerning. So. This is actually goes back to my recommendation about transparency, because if Facebook could say very easily, we're trying to take down sites like the QAnon sites, Twitter's doing, Twitter announced that, not Facebook so much, or we're trying to take down other conspiracy theory sites, we just have to believe them. Whereas if we had transparency around what, and again, I just mean for some sort of go government oversight um, committee, let's look at the anti-vax community, for example, or no, let's even look at pandemic, because at the end of the day, someday we're going to have a COVID-19 vaccine, and half of this country is not going to trust it enough to take it. And so pandemic was a video, a conspiracy theory about vaccines and about COVID-19, and it spread like wildfire on Facebook. I believe that if we had a report that showed how many people found that video because they organically looked for it, and how many found it because Facebook's algorithm amplified it or recommended it, it would be a forcing mechanism for Facebook to have to clean up that part of its platform. Now, I, I, see, I see Senator Jean Shaheen nodding in what I think is agreement. Uh, do you regard this, Senator Shaheen, as an area for legislative oversight, or for legislation for that matter, uh, to regulate the way that uh, Facebook connects people with uh, with messages. Well, I do think, based on what Yao said, that there are a lot there are a lot of places there where we need to take a look at how social media is operating, Facebook, Twitter, um, other platforms. But the other piece that we haven't really talked about is how we educate the audience for all of these efforts. Um, because that's been one of the challenges, and that struck me in, when we looked at the Russian interference in our elections in 2016, that people didn't know what to look for. They didn't, they didn't think that the information that they were getting might be manipulated. And it's one of the things we got to think about as we're thinking about how do we advise people that they need to watch where information is coming from. They need to figure out if that information is accurate, if, if it's being manipulated by somebody, who's the source. All of that is um, something that we haven't really begun to address at all in addition to any regulations of social media platforms. So I think that's a piece of it too. And we're seeing some other countries in Italy, for example, one of the things that they've done is begin to try and introduce a curriculum that helps people recognize when when they're getting misinformation or disinformation and we got to think about how we're going to address that uh david where does your uh, your strong first amendment support figure in all of this uh, i mean is is there is there a role for uh, the conspiracy theorists to be uh blocked from access to to audiences i'm sorry i missed part of the question that is 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 is, is it appropriate to stand between the uh, pandemic group or the uh, anti-vaccine people 
uh, and them them reaching a public or them being projected by their by uh, say Facebook to to the public. Or do you still yeah, stand by the First Amendment and say that's life? You know, that's uh... more or less. I, one area I think I disagree with the I.O. Uh, was I don't think Facebook. If the Boogle Boys, if two individuals from the Boogle Boys are killing somebody, I don't think Facebook is really responsible there. Like we just had this horrible killing of the judge's son, uh, and he was a, had some paranoid, crazy Trump conspiracy uh, manifesto, and I don't think it's it's the responsibility of wherever he put that manifesto up, I, or even if he met other people who believe in the manifesto, I don't think it's the responsibility of the platform, the publishing house, uh, to sort of be held responsible for the horrible thing he did. Uh, people do crazy things and they are, should be held responsible. I will say that I don't think you can talk people out of conspiracy theories. The conspiracy theories flow because they have intense distrust of the world around them. They feel that somebody must be in control uh, and then they feel superior when they can have a sense of certainty that they understand what's really going on. And so it's the emotional crisis that produces the conspiracy. I'm really reminded, Yelkin knows this and could talk to it better than I, but I cover the Middle East quite a lot. And I used to think in Iraq war, we went to democratize the Middle East, but we ended up Middle Easternizing our democracy because the conspiracy theories that are often so common there are now, are now here. Uh, and the only thing I tell people is with all due respect to everybody, um, I've covered the power elite of this country uh, for a long time. They're not competent enough to pull off a conspiracy. <laughs> I thought it would leak. Right. And so I, I disbelieve all conspiracies. Uh, I'm going to let Liel answer that uh, briefly and then we'll get on to another question. Yes, Liel. Just two quick points. I, I agree with with David that I don't think Facebook should be responsible for if somebody sees something on Facebook and in the real world goes and does something. The area where I said we need to look into is, what if we found out that those people weren't even looking for that group and that group was recommended to them or they were recommended to connect with each other? That's the point that I'm more concerned with. And I agree, conspiracy theories, it is very hard to talk someone out of a conspiracy theory, right? I used to actually run a lot of our hearts and minds work overseas during my government days. And the difference here is, it was much easier in a way because we actually sat down and had conversations and we actually sat down and listened to each other and we would, and that doesn't exist anymore. But my concern is not that I don't blame social media for everything that's happening, but it is a tool that is exploiting our deepest vulnerabilities and then targeting us with information that confirms those deepest vulnerabilities, breaks down that trust, and then opens us up by by pushing conspiracy theories at us. I mean, you look at a new moms group on Facebook and there's evidence showing that immediately they were all targeted with anti-vax ads when they were in a new moms group for support from other new moms. These are the things that concern me, not that Facebook's responsible for the fact that there's conspiracy theories in the world, but no. the scale at which they, their, their machine is exploiting our human vulnerabilities to pull us even further into being vulnerable to those theories. I'm, I'm going to take us to another uh, uh, question uh, right now. This was uh, this is from attendee Warren Diamond, who asks, uh, well, he asks all panelists, although I, I put the question about Israel to Senator Shaheen, do you think moving the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, which was promised to the American people by President Trump, hurt the chances of peace in the Middle East? And uh, I'd like to hear from everybody. Uh, Senator Shaheen, do you think so? Well, I was certainly worried that when the embassy was moved, there would be a much greater reaction among the Arab neighbors, Israel, and we did not see that. Um, I think if there is a, a real commitment on both the Israeli and Palestinian um, sides of this disagreement to come up with a two-state solution, that, that they could resolve the embassy as part of that. Um, so I think there are lots of obstacles that have been put up that have prevented or been, been cited as the reason why there hasn't been a no. settlement or a resolution. But a lot of it has, I think leadership, it's about leadership um, there as well, that if we had leaders on both sides who really wanted to see a resolution, were willing to negotiate um, and help their publics 
with the decision making that that would not be an impediment to ultimately resolving the situation. Let me let me ask first Yael and David both briefly. Um, do you think moving the embassy to Jerusalem uh, damaged the chances of peace? Um, wow, now I'm going to put on my former policy hat. Yeah. I don't want to plead the fifth a little bit, but um, I hope not. I, I think part of the question is what the motive was for doing it. If it was truly because this administration really believed that it was the right thing to do for the Middle East, that would be one thing. But the motive behind it um, is what I personally don't trust. So I'm not going to get too deep into this one. I like Senator Shaheen's answer. Yeah. You think it may have been uh, to uh, get a lot of evangelical votes back home, uh, perhaps. I, David I Brooks, uh, very political. Do you, do, you, do you think it was a, a, a danger to peace, the chances of peace, such as they are? Well, first, I think we should have got something for, for it from the Israelis. We gave the Israelis a big gift. They should have given us something back. Second, I do think it's the right move. Is Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And so acknowledging reality, I think, is generally a smart thing. But while you acknowledge that reality, that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, you have to acknowledge another reality, that Ramallah and Hebron and Nablus are parts of a Palestinian homeland. Uh, and that's why Senator Shaheen is so right to keep emphasizing the two-state solution. And so my basic approach is just acknowledge the realities that are on the ground and try to build a political solution around what actually exists. Here's a, a question for you. Could David uh, Brooks discuss America's current position uh, where, according to uh, Rio, Rio, Rio is, the, uh, is their attendee, where most other countries view America as an object of pity, unable to act collectively, as opposed to the leader of the West and the rallying force for combating enemies, both viral and military in nature? I don't know if you agree with that assessment, David, but the question is, what do you, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I certainly have heard a lot of it from friends abroad that uh, America, Trump was seen as an embarrassment enough, but our per collective performance comes to seem like the decline of the American nation state. I don't think that's baked in. I don't think that's permanent. I think we can recover. But um, this is a moment where uh, there's been a tremendous loss of confidence. I see it in Congress. I just read a, a speech from Senator Sheen's uh, colleague, uh, Josh Hawley from Missouri. And it was about how America should stop playing a big role in the world. We, could, we don't have to take care of ourselves. And that's a loss of confidence. Uh, and President Trump has withdrawn from the world. Uh, and so we have a loss of confidence based on a loss of confidence in ourselves. But isn't, uh, isn't that one of the oddities of the year of the pandemic, which is that uh, one of the steps that the government took uh, in response to the pandemic was to close off contact with the outside world. Uh, if, if there ever were an argument to say we want to know absolutely everybody who's crossing the border into the country, it's when there's a virus for which we have no uh, therapeutic and no vaccine on, on the loose. Oddly, uh, the events of the pandemic seem to, to reinforce isolationism. Yeah, well, I covered the end of the Soviet Union and I covered it in those years, I covered the Oslo peace process. I covered Mandela coming out of prison, the reunification of Germany, uh, the EU Maastricht Treaty, the coming together. And the great theme of those years was convergence, barriers falling, us converging. The great theme of the last 25 years has been walls and barriers. And this is not only an American problem. I think Macron, uh, the French prime minister, uh, president, um, gave a very forceful interview this week saying the EU project, it's over that even in the EU project, they all went into the nation state. And so China is now gonna have their own stack of industries. We're gonna have a separate stack of industries. And so we are re-entering what looks like a, a period of 19th century great power competition, which is not how it looked in 1991. Yeah. Okay, I have one last question, which you'll have to be very brief with. But uh, uh, Marty Isaac asks to, uh, to all of you, uh, what's your recommendation? What's your uh, number one recommendation, I'll say, to improve life in the United States? So there's, there's this one hell of a short answer question. Gael Eisenstadt. Uh, oh, no, what's, I'm up first. What's the, what's the one thing that, uh, that, that you would want to see change most? I don't know if I would say most because there's many, but I'll just say one thing that's relevant for right now. I would really love to see a resurgence of a public service mindset or of a little bit more collective. I mean, I know that the United States is really built on individualism, on freedom to be completely individual, but we are in a crisis right now that absolutely requires us 
to either consider the plight of our neighbors, whether we agree with them or not. So what could make our country better is if we could figure out both through civil discourse that Senator Sheen and David Brooks mentioned before, okay. how to get back to a slightly more, I consider it patriotic, thinking about the United States and our fellow Americans in a more collective way. And David Brooks, you have your one magic, uh, magic wand. Uh, uh, well, wave. I run a project called Weave, uh, the Social Fabric Project, and it, what we do is we take, we give money, resources, and attention to people who live in the neighborhoods that they serve to rebuild community, and they are morally uplifting, but they're actually doing the thing I've been talking about all hour, which is rebuilding trust at the local level. So, if somewhere in your town there is a marginalized community, and somewhere in that community, there are people who live in that community, who serve the kids in that community, the homeless in that community, the drug addicts in that community, and they are the future, and they are the best solution for what this society needs. And Senator Shaheen? Well, David, I think that's a wonderful project, but my answer is easy to this. I think we need to elect a new president. <laughs> I think, and that is certainly to the point. Uh, Senator Jean Shaheen, David Brooks of the New York Times, the allies and staff of, uh, of uh, Cornell Tech. Thanks to all of you very much for, for taking part in this uh, uh, web seminar. Uh, I, I have some thank yous to, to offer to other folks, to Joshua Plout, uh, Nate Banzani, and uh, Rona Gibigliano of the American Friends of Rabin Medical Center. Uh, it is, by the way, a 501c3 nonprofit, which represents Israel's largest hospital, Rabin Medical Center in the U.S., uh, the website is www.afrmc.org. Also, thanks to our Global Connections partner, Yuval Rose of Digital Asset and uh, Yuval's team. We'll see you next month at Global Connections, navigating the new abnormal. I'm Robert Siegel. Uh, stay healthy and stay safe. Bye-bye. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.